Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, thanks so much for joining us for yet another episode. And I am here with my new friend, Sarah Wiley. Thank you, Sarah, for making time for the Boca Podcast. Yeah, no problem. I'm super excited. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I am too. And and you know, we're gonna we're gonna get into a topic today which is really, really interesting that I, I don't think we've spent enough time on yet. We've, we've kind of dabbled in it, but that is Facebook marketing. And it's a massive topic with, you know, an hour episode, we can only spend or get into so much detail, but it sounds like you've got a lot to offer. And we're going to touch on that or get into that in more detail here in just a few minutes. But first of all, I want to start the podcast off as we normally do with something that we call our technique for time. And um, you are, as, as we're going to find out here, a relatively new business owner, but you're really busy already. Admits that business, that busyness, what do you do to create space for yourself to give yourself a little bit more freedom and flexibility as a photography business owner? Yeah. So like you mentioned, I'm definitely really new still. <laughs> I still consider myself very new to the industry. So I'll be honest and say I'm not the best at time management, but what I have noticed helps is I will just make make it a point to step away from my computer for even two hours to just take my dogs to the dog park or something silly like organize something in my house or take a bath, just something so I can reset myself yeah. for a couple hours and get back on the workflow. That's good. And you know, there's something you mentioned dogs, there's something so interestingly therapeutic about about having a pet and oh, yeah. i think more specifically dogs even even just to be able to like reach over and pet them as you're as you're scrolling through the images that you need to call to, to get ready to edit or whatever the case may be but oh, yeah taking a, a break with a pet taking a break with a friend a family member or a partner whatever it might be um, not only has the, the the psychological and ultimately physiological benefits, um, but also gives you that that kind of clarity, the mental clarity, the reset, as you said, so that when you do come back to that artistic endeavor, which is being a wedding or a portrait photographer, um, you have the creativity that you need again. That's really really important to make that time. And, and I, I love your honesty too, and saying, you know what, I'm I'm new to this. I'm really busy. I'm not the best at time management, but I'm at least making the effort to do these very things. And and I think. That that's where it starts. The the awareness and then the proactivity and, and creating a little bit of space here and there. Because the reality is if we don't do that, it's easy to get absolutely burnt out in the end, right? Yes, exactly. And that is definitely one of the things that I've been trying to focus on is obviously time management. So with that, I've started kind of outsourcing projects, even hiring someone to come over and help me clean the house or call through a wedding or get stuff ready to outsource. So I that's super important because the last few weeks I've felt so much better and it's yeah. because I've been kind of outsourcing projects. <laughs> well, th there's, there's a book that I've mentioned um, before on the podcast and, and actually it's totally slipping my mind right the second. I'm gonna have to look it up as we're talking, but the idea of creating a sustainable business model, part of what is innate to that concept is very simply outsourcing or delegating because at the end of the day as business owners if we continue to function like employees and let mm -hmm. us or kind of let ourselves be overrun and overwhelmed with all of the things that have to be done in a business we're not going to ever be able to effectively move our business forward to, to, to grow it like we could um, exactly. and we're certainly going to get burnt out in that process and, and so it's really, really important. There are a number of ways that we can save time to create space for ourselves, but I, I love that you bring up delegation or outsourcing, if you will, where we're handing projects or tasks off to somebody else who is just as, if not more capable than we are to get that thing accomplished. 
and now gives us either free time to focus on those things that actually will grow our business, move our business forward, or maybe mm-hmm. just time to uh, to get out and go to the dog park, as you pointed out, which is really, really great. And and uh, the book that I was alluding to a, f- a few minutes ago is The E-Myth, or E-Myth Revisited is the more, more recent version. So for those of you listening in who have not read that book, I highly recommend taking a look at it. The idea of creating the systems and ultimately business structure necessary to create a sustainable business, and potentially even one that you could sell down the road, it's, it's good to at least be aware of the principles in that book. So I highly recommend that. We'll listen, we'll, we'll link to that uh, in the show notes. I'd love to hear something kind of random about you, Sarah, that most people don't know. I, and I'll, I'll say this before you answer the question, just going to your Instagram account uh, or social media, I, you, you just look like the most fun, most vibrant, uh, alive yeah. personality. Like I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation just for that fact. And I'm sure it translates <laughs> to the experience that you create for your clients. But tell us something kind of random that most people don't know about you. Yeah, and that's that's so funny you say that because I like to just have a lot of fun and do fun things and be having a good time. One thing that I would definitely think that a lot of people who are not used to me wouldn't know is that I actually started on the other side of the camera. So I modeled and acted for about 10 years. Oh, wow. And I, yeah, so that really helped me, obviously. But I started out doing that and I was doing little commercial projects and infomercials. I'd I'd be an extra on TV shows and all of that good stuff. So I think that's something most people definitely do not know because it somehow transitioned into this thing where I hate having my picture taken now, which is, yeah, which is so funny. (laughs) Why why do you think that is? Um, You know, I'm not sure. I think it's because if when I used to model, I could kind of put my vision together in front of the camera. And now I just like doing it with other people. And if I can avoid being in front of it, I definitely will because I can just kind of create my vision on these other people. And there's something cool about that to me. Yeah, no, that, that is cool. And I, I think, well, I'm curious, actually, if you were to pick like the biggest thing that you took away being on the other side of the camera that you're able to now translate to the photographic experience that you create for your clients to make them feel more comfortable in front of the camera to be more emotive, what would that thing be? What, what comes to mind? You know, there are so many things. One of the things in particular that I can think of is that, which this is an obvious statement, but every single client is going to be different. So like when I was modeling, each photographer I worked with was completely different and not all of them took the time to really ask me questions or interact with me during the shoot. And Mm. I think that's something as photographers, we all make sure to do is just get to know your client. Even if my session is with a five-year-old kid for his birthday, I'll just kind of ask him questions throughout the shoot and try to make him as comfortable as possible because that really shows in your photos. You can tell if someone's not having a good time. Yeah, I I like that you have a conversation to get to know them first because as you say they are very different and so that lends perspective and then and then ideally you have a number of tools uh in the the back of your mind that you can pull from depending on their personality depending on how comfortable they are with the camera but but g- again going back to the 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 significance of communicating with them to begin with. And I've given this example before on the podcast, but I'm going to reiterate it because I think it's really important. It's a bit of an extreme example, but my experience when I've gone to photography workshops and, and, and watched photographers interact with the model or the models there at the photography workshops is that there is absolutely many, and in some cases, many cases even, there is little to no communication whatsoever. Yeah. And that's fascinating to me. And I understand that the, the environment is different. If, if you're one-on-one with a client, maybe you're more apt to communicate. But I think it's a good reminder that you can't just simply put a client in front of the, the camera and maybe say a few cliche phrases, you know, act like you like each other or whatever the, the cliche phrase is yeah. and expect them to just perform for the camera. Understanding who they are to begin with and then translating that to how you instruct them in the session is really, really important. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you make that point. I think it's a good reminder for, for all of us for that matter. Speaking of being a photographer, and we mentioned the fact that you're a relatively new photographer, and this is by no means a negative thing. I mean, you've, you've translated, well, I guess ultimately you've grown your business very, very quickly. And we're going to talk more about how you've done that. But 
Talk to us about the backstory. Like how long have you been in business as a photographer to start with, but how did you actually get started in the process and grow so quickly? So I have been doing this really only professionally for about three years now. And I I guess the backstory for me is I've always been interested in cameras, not necessarily taking photos of people, but I've always kind of taken photos of nature and just like the aspect of creating images. And then about three years ago, I just kind of was feeling honestly sad one day. So I'm like, I should just try to take pictures of people and switch it up. So I called up my best friend and it was so cheesy. We made this like super fake flower crown from Michael <laughs> with super fake flowers. And it was funny. We went into the forest near my house and I started taking pictures of her. And honestly, ever since then, that's been something that's kind of sparked me and got me excited. And after I did that session with her, I think because of the network that I had, people just started contacting me of, oh, hey, I'm looking for new headshots or um, we're looking for pictures of our family. And it kind of just went from there. I I definitely worked very hard for this, but I a lot of it was a lot of it was luck as well, because I took her out. And ever since then, it's been extremely busy and I've had to kind of learn as I go. So I've been teaching myself. Yeah every session, like something new to do or something to take from that. So it's a learning process for sure. But you obviously, I mean, you, you say that you've been lucky, but I have to say like you're, whatever it is that you're learning, whatever you, you are doing proactively to improve as a photographer is translating to your images. And I'm actually on your Instagram account right now. And for those of you listening in, you've got to check out Sarah's work. If you go to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, Lynn, L-Y-N-N, photography, P-D-X, uh, is the is the Instagram handle. You've got to check out her work because not only is there a wide variety of images, and I really love that about your account. You know, a lot of times um, you'll go to an Instagram account and for the sake of looking pretty, photographers will have this kind of themed look to their images. And I understand the thought process there. I love that you just kind of like no holds barred, just put all types of photography, all types of color, <laughs> and it's very, very vibrant. So it's enjoyable to look at, but yeah. the variety is impressive and, and the quality is impressive. So kudos to you for just moving Thank so you. quickly. And it's very obvious that you're proactively trying to learn to improve consistently as you go. I also love the notion of, of just kind of diving in. And it's that idea of actually a better analogy, like jumping and building your wings on, on the way down. It seems yes. like you've taken that approach. And there's something really fun about that. You know, there, we have this incredible uh, resource called Google um, that enables us to be able to very quickly search an idea or a concept or a principle and, and read an, a blog article or watch a YouTube video and be able to then take that information and go apply it right away to what we do. Because we have digital photography, we get the immediate feedback. We can make adjustments as necessary. There's really no excuse for us as photographers now not to, to be consistently improving uh, and, and almost immediately to have a really high quality image coming out of that camera going to the gallery because we have access to these resources. So yeah. Kudos to you for taking advantage of that, for making it happen. I love that kind of proactive mentality that you've got. But as far as your photography business is concerned, you're a wedding and portrait photographer. Is that right? Yeah, I do. I, I do everything, but I primarily do weddings and portraits for sure. Okay. And, and to that point, and this is something that we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you'll share what your photography business's brand position is. And for those of you listening in who aren't familiar with the concept, very simply, uh, the idea of a brand position is what it's, it's an idea, a concept representing your business that sets your business apart from other photography businesses in your market. What would that be for you, Sarah? Yeah. And so this, like we were talking about, is obviously a very lengthy question for me. But in short, I definitely would say that I'm still in the process of learning exactly what that is, because like we talked about, I am so new. But something that people definitely always come to me for is they want that not necessarily journalistic approach, but they want photos of their guests. And they, of course, want incredible photos of themselves, but they really want to capture people interacting with each other. They yeah. want to get those family members that have traveled 2000 miles to see their wedding. They want to see their reaction while they're watching the ceremony. And 
I mean, people come to me for colorful stuff. So it's definitely a mix between capturing their guests and the more candid, the more candid stuff. And then also the colorful, vibrant, like you saw on my Instagram, just keeping stuff very fun and colorful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm hearing a tagline as, you, as you're describing this, uh, Sarah Wiley, uh, colorful photojournalism. That might be your, your new tagline <laughs> because yes. it, it kind of aptly describes or sums up what it is that you're offering. It is your images are extremely vibrant and not just vibrant in color, but also in emotion. Yeah. And then, and I love the fact that, and, and uh, that, that your clients are actually pointing out to you what they enjoy about your photography. And for those of you listening in, you're not sure what your brand position is. And if you just do a quick Google search, uh, brand position, you can even find an article on Wikipedia about the principle or the concept of a brand position. And you're trying to work out what your brand position might be. And Sarah, you and I talked about this before. Before we started recording, a lot of photographers will say, well, my brand position is I am a I, I, I like to focus on the emotions of an image or uh, I like to have good relationships with my clients. And this is just a couple of examples. But what you have to keep in mind is that there are thousands of other photographers out there who do those very things. So the question is, how can you truly set yourself apart from the, the local market or the local so-called competition. I think most of us at this point are more about the community over competition idea that the Rising Tide Society promotes. But um, you're, you still have competition in the sense that your potential client is going to look at you and then they're going to compare you to other photographers in your market. How is it that you truly distinguish yourself from those other photographers? And uh, maybe kind of a, a wild and out there example of how to be specific when it comes to a brand position would be instead of saying, hey, I'm a wedding photographer, you could say I'm a wedding photographer who only shoots black and white images of clients who are Harry Potter fans. And of course, there are ways that you can you can kind of sum that up or, or make that statement shorter. But ultimately, this kind of specificity where you're truly not only do you shoot a very, very specific type of photography, but then that photography is for a very specific market segment. That is how specific you should be getting as and, and not you, Sarah, obviously, but for our listeners as a whole, for all of us should be getting as a brand. You should know exactly what it is that you offer. And ideally, it's something different than what your competition is offering and then what your target market is, who you are offering that to. And not only will that help set you apart, because when somebody hears something like that, they're going to be like, oh, my word, that's I've never heard that before. And then the next time I need that type of photography, I'm going to go to Sarah Wiley. Or I'm going to go to Nathan Holritz or whoever it might be. Uh, but then it also makes it easier to market your business. There's no question about what it is that you're marketing, what it is that you're offering to a potential client. And so when you're coming up with copy especially for Facebook ads. We're going to talk about Facebook marketing here in just a little bit. Um, but when you're coming up with copy for marketing, it's a much easier to come up with a copy because there's no question about what you offer. You're not having to pick from 50 different things. You know, I used to go to, I've talked about this in the podcast before, I go to these networking meetings as a, as a wedding photographer and I'd hear a photographer say, I specialize in, and then they'd list, you know, three, four or five different types of photography the reality is you're not, first of all, you're not doing yourself a favor because you're not setting yourself apart, but then um, you're, you're not really a specialist if you're specializing, quote unquote, specializing in five different things. So my encouragement, I know there are plenty of businesses out there who are doing fine as is, but could potentially be doing better if they really narrow in on their focus and what they're offering as a service. And that's going to translate to much simpler easier to understand, more distinguishable marketing efforts, and it'll translate to a, a, a significant benefit to our business. So uh, enough of the rant on my end about, about brand position. But I love, Sarah, I love the fact that, that you have a very clear idea of what it is that you're offering. Your clients are commenting on that. And uh, this is really, really important when it comes to setting our businesses apart uh, within our local market. I'm curious what the toughest lesson is. And this is actually, I'm really curious, especially being in business only a few years and yet having translated to such a successful business, Sarah, what is the toughest lesson that you've learned so far as a business owner? Yeah. And this is one <laughs> where I laugh because I'm like, where do I start? I have learned so much within such a short amount of time, but I honestly have to say the one thing that I 
to this date have made sure to be very proactive about is deposits because time is so incredibly important. And I know that you are all about saving time and being smart about your time. So deposits are the one thing that I learn the hard way and that I always make sure to collect. <laughs> and is that because you had too many experiences where, where the client didn't follow through and pay for their wedding or you had to spend a lot of time following up to get the money for them or what, what, what was that like? So not, not necessarily with weddings, but even just with sessions, I would, I would kind of go out of my way to go get props and crafts and stuff along those lines. And I would put all of this effort and time into the shoot. And then come the day of, they I'll get a text saying, oh, well, we can't make it. And I'll say, okay, well, are you interested in rescheduling? And sometimes they are, but sometimes they kind of disappear. And it's like, well, dang yeah. it. <laughs> I just put in all this work. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it. Well, having that financial commitment, even if it's a little bit of a financial commitment, um, tends to, to encourage people to follow through a little bit yes, more consistently. Exactly. So, yeah, great reminder, great advice, uh, particularly to new photographers. Make sure that you do build that into the process and, and into your contract as well so that if they end up canceling and never rescheduling, you're not walking away totally empty-handed. I think that's exactly great advice for our listeners. Let, let's go a different direction. What is a favorite piece of gear in your gear bag these days? A lens, a camera body, accessory? What's a favorite thing that comes to mind? So I have a lot of things, but my favorite, I will say my favorite lens is my Canon 85 1.2. It, it took a while to grow on me, but now that I've kind of shot with it a lot, I am obsessed with it. <laughs> what do you love most about that 85 1.2? Is it the, the shallow depth of field or? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it just, exactly what you said. It creates such a beautiful image. And I actually kind of like that you have to get a little further back because if I use my other lenses, sometimes I tend to not move around and I get stuck in this like, oh, I have to shoot them from this specific angle. Sure. So the 85 is kind of nice for me because I have to force myself to get creative and kind of go further back from them and maybe do it from a different direction. And the 85 it is notoriously kind of funky about focusing. So I was going to ask does, you about that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's got some, um, different with focusing. It does take a little bit to get the focus, but once you do, it's worth it. And I know they created a new one, the 1. 1.4. So I definitely have my eye after that one, <laughs> but what do you usually definitely... shoot wide open at one, two, or do you, do you stop it back to one, four or one, eight, just to make sure you're getting the client in focus? How do you approach that? Yeah. So that's honestly why I'm looking at getting the one four, because I don't often find myself going past one four. Cause if I do go past one four, it's just, everything's super blurry and it focused on one little fingernail or right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely try to not go past one four. I found that my sweet spot is kind of 1.6 to 2.2. Honestly, with that lens, I really like cool. that look. Is there a second item that's kind of a favorite these days? Oh, yeah. Um, this one's kind of silly, but I love challenging myself. So I I went on Amazon one day and I was looking for something that could create light because I've, I've, I study a lot of different photographers and I love doing new things. So I know a lot of people do like the copper pipe and some people will do prisms. And I got this little glass ring on Amazon and it was a dollar and I bring it to every single wedding. It literally creates like a globe effect and it just makes the lights look amazing. So I try to use it for dance shots and fun stuff. And that is my one dollar piece of gear that I love. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, we may have to link to yeah. this in the show notes too, for our listeners yeah. that are a little bit more curious. The, the other thing too, and this isn't something I normally ask our guests, but I'm curious as I'm looking at your images here, mm -hmm. um, it, as much as, you know, these, these various trends, even when it comes to lighting, uh, kind of come and go, you've got a pretty classic look and feel to your images, which I, which I love. There seems to be a great awareness of light. I'm looking mm -hmm. at a, a couple of shots here. There's beautiful rim light on the subjects. Um, but your your images also have a particular finish. They're not they're even not even close to over processed, but they have a particular finish. Is there a Lightroom preset or preset pack that you use as you're processing your images? 
Oh gosh. Yes. So I, since I am so new, I kind of, I went down the hole of buying like every single preset <laughs> and trying to match everybody. Yep. And I finally have come to have a specific style, like you said. And I have noticed that most of my stuff I usually use, there's two. I definitely use small from time to time. And then the Visco, I think it's the pack. Oh, one. Okay. But they have two specific presets that I use in there pretty regularly. Yeah. And I mean, I will be completely honest. I definitely kind of veer from that very farly, but I definitely start with those. And then I like to tweak it, obviously, to what I like to do. And then I'll just copy that setting and paste it on my photos. So it so it goes quicker for me. Yeah, which is which is an intelligent way, an efficient way to go about the post production process. It is fun to tweak and adjust yeah, for sure, <laughs> and and there are so many different options out there. But uh, again, kudos to you for whatever the finish is that you're choosing to apply to your images. The one thing I can say for sure is that it's not trendy. And what our what photographers have to keep in mind is is as exciting as it is to try this new effect and that new effect and and apply yeah. this look. You know, whether it's the extreme desaturation or extremely dark dark images or um, like a really, really intense film finish. All of these things are are fun, no doubt. But what we have to keep in mind is three, four, five years from now, you're going to go back and look at those images likely and be like, oh my word, what was I thinking when I applied exactly. that effect? Best to, to go or to not go to the extreme, to find something that certainly has a wonderful look and maybe reflects how you feel or the so-called personal style that you have, but not to go to the extreme because not only will your, your clients not benefit from that, but you're going to be likely regretting it too. And I've told this story before yeah. in the podcast, but like I, I had a, a, an engagement album that I had created for a client that I ended up using as a actually it was an engagement uh, a sample engagement album that we had in our office mm -hmm. and um, I remember after I don't know maybe even just like a year after having created that album opening it up one day and and just thinking like oh my goodness what in the world did I do to these images and I'd applied some like Lomo effect or cross process yeah. or some combination of the above and, yeah. it, and it just looked terrible um, we have to keep in mind that while a trend is, is a lot of fun to follow for the time being, that the images that we give to our clients, we should be at least making somewhat of an effort to maintain a, a classic look and feel. And I think that's really important. Yeah, exactly. And just one more quick thing about yeah. that. Like you hit on, I have obviously grown and um, liked a lot of different styles over the time. But the one thing as a new um, business owner or going into photography, that is really hard as you do want to conform to all those styles. Like I follow so many people that do the gorgeous muted tone work and they get all this attention. And it's, it's honestly hard to kind of stay in your lane as an artist. But the thing about my stuff is I look back four years ago. And even though I got better with editing, I've always really loved that colorful stuff. So I will go back and say, hey, I want to just re-edit something because I'm feeling kind of artsy today. And it's I don't tweak too much. So that's the nice thing about my style is that it has been pretty consistent, like you said. So it makes it a little easier for me. <laughs> and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I, I think I think what's lost a lot of times in this process of being a photographer and developing a workflow is we don't have, we're not better business owners or cooler photographers because we have this, you know, 50 step process to editing exactly. photos. Um, but first of all, ideally you're taking advantage of services like photographers edit that enable you to save time. You, you, you yep. come up with a style and you're able to communicate that to a company like photographers editor, or maybe an in-house assistant or whatever it might be. But then that process can be taken care of very, very simply by someone else because you don't have this overly complicated process. Now, if you do it yourself, again, you're spending so much time on something that really ultimately only matters to you. And, and there's something very significant to doing what matters to you as a photography business owner, no question, but there's gotta be a, a line somewhere. So coming up with an efficient system, what, what I say to photographers who use Photographer's Edit, for example, is we use that preset as a, as a baseline finish. When we say, hey, upload your favorite preset to Photographer's Edit, we'll apply that for you. We use that as a baseline finish for the images. We're still gonna make adjustments to brightness, to contrast, et cetera. 
but it's yeah. a baseline finish. A lot of photographers will refer to a preset as their style, and I think there's a lot more to style than just simply a, a particular color finish to an image. You as a photographer are going to create particular types of imagery through the camera that have nothing to do with that preset. The preset does give a finish to the image, but don't overly complicate the process and cost yourself hours and hours of time per event or per portrait session um, exactly. in the name of creating this this fancy thing in order to get a bunch of likes from other photographers. At the end of the day, create beautiful imagery for your clients, create an efficient system that enables you to provide that in a relatively sane amount of time. Um, yes. and, and everybody wins, I think. Yep, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of time, we already mentioned that you've only been in business for, for three years, but I guess one of the reasons that I, I want to, I, I keep emphasizing that there's something to this, which is that you've created a, a really successful business in that short amount of time. I know you've photographed over a hundred weddings already, mm -hmm. and not only do you photograph, but now you have a team of photographers as well. Uh, yeah. But talk to us, talk to me a little bit, because I, one of the things that you mentioned to me was like 99% of the business that you've gotten has come through Facebook. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's completely accurate. I, I'm i super lucky that I figured out the Facebook world on my own because I know that a lot of people struggle with it. So it's, yeah, it most of my business does come through Facebook. And has that always been the case? Did you did you start off that way, or was there some point where you're like, you know what, I, I we're going to shift some things around here. I'm going to focus on Facebook because I see I'm, that I'm getting good results from there. So with me personally, I after like I mentioned to you, I modeled for ten years, so I've always kind of had an understanding for I guess the social network aspect of it, and Facebook itself has always been such an incredible platform for me. And when I got started, I immediately created a page for my business knowing that I wanted to um, invite people and kind of have them come along my, photo my photography journey. And I didn't intentionally want to do photography as a job, really. I just, I wanted to invite people to kind of see my stuff and stay updated. And yeah, as soon as I started my Facebook page, I immediately invited everybody on my friends list to like my page. I would start playing around with um, boosting posts just to get stuff out there. Yeah. And it was just really important for me to tap into Facebook and use it to promote my business because I saw the potential in it. Well, and so we're going to dig into a little bit of what has worked really well for you here in just a second. But I, I want to start with the kind of the opposite of that. What doesn't work? Um, because, you know, obviously our listeners are going to want to know, okay, if, if she's if she's booking this many weddings this mm -hmm. short into her career, how is she doing that through Facebook? And Facebook seems like this never ending uh, almost pit of, I mean, potential certainly, but then confusion as well, because there are constant changes and, and more and more businesses are, have, have gotten on Facebook. And so it's a lot noisier. It's more crowded. Um, but let's start with what doesn't work. First of all, what would you say would be just based on your experience, a couple of the biggest mistakes that photographers can make when it comes to using Facebook as a marketing platform? Well, I can definitely say that the first biggest mistake when I was thinking about this question, um, I thought about the main things. And the first one is when people give up, whether it be any type of um, business on Facebook, if you're real estate or um, photography or an editing outsourcing company, if you just give up on your page and kind of stop posting and throw in the towel, you definitely can't utilize it and you won't be getting the fullest potential out of it. So giving up is definitely the first biggest mistake that I see with a lot of fellow photographers is they'll just get frustrated that it's not bringing them business and they'll kind of just stop using Facebook and go back to Instagram, not realizing how much money it can make you. That's interesting. And it, it, when you say not giving up, so posting consistently is important. Does that, yes. have you found that that then plays into the effective, effectiveness of the boosted posts and or the ads that you run as well? Um, absolutely. And the thing that I've noticed, a lot of people have this um, stigma about Facebook that, oh, you, you, once you pay to boost, like your posts will never get noticed other than that. And I have worked with it so much over the last three years that 
I am to the point where I can boost my posts for less than I would have previously. Interesting. And my organic posts still reach a, a heavy amount of people. So that doesn't have that negative effect on me that most people experience with that. That's interesting. Okay. So don't give up on posting or maybe instead another way, just be consistent. Uh, that's really, really important. I've certainly been yes. guilty of the opposite of that. I, I think it's important that we, that we're consistent on, on yeah. the platforms that are currently popular and then also are kind of open-minded and looking for the next thing that's coming up too. But right now, yeah. definitely Facebook, Instagram are kind of where it's at. So don't give up. That's the first thing. What's, what's another, uh, or, or giving up, I guess would be one of the biggest mistakes. What's another big mistake that photographers make when it comes to using Facebook as a marketing platform? Yeah. So the, um, the second biggest mistake that I personally see is, and I see this in a lot of the photography groups I'm in, um, people will be posting about this, but one of the biggest mistakes you can make is I see people that will pay say $80 to boost a post, but they don't have their target audience down and they're not sure what they're doing. So they're just throwing that money away, kind of essentially just throwing a ball in the field and hoping it hits something. They yeah. just kind of are going to spending money blindly, plan. right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's so important with even Instagram or Facebook or anything. You have to really go to the bare bone basics and figure out your audience and what's going to work. And then you can slowly add in a couple bucks and go from there. And I know this is a topic in and of itself, but it, are there certain things that you did in order to dial in your, or first of all, develop an awareness of your target market, be really clear for the sake of your brand, who you're going after, but then how did you dial that in on the Facebook platform itself? Ooh, I'm uh, so excited to okay. talk about this because I just, I feel like such a little Facebook guru. So what I do or when I started I had the generic um, target audience and I wasn't bringing in any traffic. I'm like, okay, how can I fix this? So I went into the section of the, um, when you boost a post, you can go into, you can select your specific audience. So if I work a wedding, I will immediately come home that night or the next day and edit, say, 10 to 15 photos post it. And then underneath I'll boost the post and I'll create an audience. So Typically, when I create an audience, I make sure that it's really hitting the people that I want to book. So if I if I post a wedding, I really want to book more weddings off of it. So I might get as specific as going to engage couples or people that are in a relationship on Facebook and people that like pages that have to do with love and engagement and fun stuff like that. I think that really helps. So understanding what it is that, that they like and then using those those concepts, those ideas uh, yes. as a as not keywords, but as um, what is what is it that Facebook actually terms it in that interface? Interests? You know, yeah, I, th I believe they they use the verbiage of interest and then it obviously goes down to what area. But that kind of goes without saying you just kind of post you target it to what areas you want to work in and you can do. I do every single city that's remotely near me. And okay. yeah, as far as the love and relationships, I think that goes under interest. And then, yeah, you can, it's really interesting once you get in there because you can really customize that and yes. hit exactly who you want to hit. Yeah, absolutely. And and the key here is specificity, right? And And it's yes. interesting that something that we should be doing or should have been doing already anyway as business owners being very highly aware of our target market or target clients um it's now an absolute necessity if you if you want to be successful on Facebook as a marketing platform so i'm glad that you make that point if if you're not currently first of all if you're not boosting posts or running ads on Facebook this is something to begin if you just do a quick google search you can you can pull up information there's a lot of information out there frankly uh, we just did a we just posted a recent episode with Easton Reynolds but if you need a good resource for kind of how to start or to, to go about this process get started specifically in Facebook ads make sure that you go back to um, 
episode 135 uh, with Easton Reynolds. Make sure you go check that episode out as well to get a little bit better perspective about what it means to run a Facebook ad. But anyway, all this to say, be very, very specific when it is, when, you, when you're going to create that boosted post or that Facebook ad, make sure you, you know your target market, your target clientele, and that you're speaking their language and you're using that when it comes to targeting their interests or uh, understanding the demo that you're going after and using that as an element in that Facebook ad or the boosted post that's really, really important. Let's transition though from what not to do to what to do. And I know that you've got some ideas that you're gonna share about how to more effectively drive business on Facebook. And this may even tie into what Easton shared as well. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear how you found the success on Facebook, Sarah. Will you, will you share some of those big ideas with our listeners? Absolutely. And I, one of my very first one that is so important is kind of one that goes into what didn't work is consistency is that it's so incredibly important to be posting on your page. And even if you need to go back and pull photos from an old post, just get something up there. So you're constantly showing up in people's feeds. And when you say consistency, I mean, are we talking like two or three times a day, once a day, three or four times a week? Like what kind of, when you, when you think about how often you're posting, what have you found uh, is most effective for your business? You know, I, I, I don't have a specific number for you because sometimes if I do a couple shoots a day, I'll want to post one from each of those. So I'll do the morning and the night. Other times, like right now we're kind of in the middle of a big move. So I only posted yesterday and I probably won't post again until later tonight or tomorrow. But I would say at the very least, try to be posting at least like once every two days, preferably every day, just so you can really stay fresh in people's minds and just stay busy. And and then the the other side of consistency, I'm curious how consistently, maybe you're getting ready to speak on this, but how consistently are you boosting posts? Do you do it with every post or just every other post or does it depend? So that is kind of the magic thing that I have discovered is I really, I have tapped into this um, specific thing that works for me and I honestly will post I post pretty frequently, at least once a day, sometimes once every two days. I really only boost wedding posts. And I've got to the point where I have made my own network within my personal page that I will share my photography stuff on my personal page. So I don't actually boost too much. So the way Facebook works is that they charge you per month. So some months, I will post photos from every single wedding and I will pay maybe $5 per wedding post. So some months I am only spending $40 on boosting posts, whereas other months if I'm running a mini special for families during the fall or trying to get some new clientele, I'll spend on the upwards of 60, 70 bucks. But I really don't spend too much. And I think once you really lock that down, you're going to attract those clients so that they'll eventually just follow along and you won't have to pay to get their um, views on your stuff. Okay, cool. Well, I I appreciate that perspective. And there is, there is so much to dig into this and, and I love that you figured out specifically what's worked for you. And that's important for our listeners as well. First of all, it's important that you take the steps to actually begin utilizing the platform, not just simply posting, but spending a little bit of money, boosting those posts, and then making adjustments and seeing where you get the best results. But you talked about consistency. So as the first kind of big idea, take us to the next idea. Yeah. And so the next idea kind of goes hand in hand with consistency, but it is just um, staying active. So in these all I could go on for hours about, but as far as staying active, that's just making sure that like I said, you're posting as when you can and as much as you can, but not so much just that, but sharing your stuff with your friends so they can be interacting on your posts. And another big thing that I've noticed with Facebook, when I say stay active, I don't just mean posting. I mean, you have to be interacting with people that are showing you love on your stuff because 
just like with Instagram, everybody wants to know that you're listening to them and yep. that you're acknowledging what they're saying. Such a great point. Yeah. And, and and you're right. I mean, as much as it's important to be posting consistently, if you're not actually engaging with those people who care to even, I mean, you know, it's one thing I, I, I had this conversation with my son recently. I think I even mentioned it on the podcast, but it was interesting to me. He was, he was talking about basically his tendency to kind of just scroll and like yeah. Um, I, I was I was observing this because he had liked a post of mine, but didn't know what I had talked about in the post, and and I, I wasn't I didn't think that he'd done anything wrong. I was curious to understand the psychology behind it, like the the behavioral yeah. psychology behind it, and he had essentially liked the post because he was yeah I'm, obviously I'm his dad, and and so he just wants <laughs> to make sure that that I feel like he's he's paying attention a little bit basically yeah. But there's a difference <laughs> between just simply liking because we know a lot of people are scrolling through and double tapping because it's easy. They happen, they, they, the image caught their eye, it's appealing to them, but they're mm-hmm. not necessarily reading what you wrote or exactly. responding. I, I, it always cracks me up, like the, um, the number of people that are asking questions, trying to get some interaction on a post, somebody will like it, but not take the time to actually engage. And probably a big reason why that is the case is they're not even taking the time to read that text. So if exactly. somebody is actually making the effort and taking the time to engage, to respond not only to the image, but to what you've actually written that goes with that post, we should definitely acknowledge that. And um, so I'm glad that you point that out. And that will further encourage engagement down the road because now they they know that you're going to actually be respond responsive to them or with them and um, they're more likely to engage with you in the future as well and that type of engagement also kind of boosts priority when it comes to facebook's algorithm so that's important to keep in mind yes cool yes. all right I, I, I i'm so excited i'm just talking too much i need to let you talk <laughs> take us to the next principle no, it's okay. Um, like I said, I could go on forever about this stuff. I'm super passionate about Facebook, obviously. Um, so the next thing I definitely would say would to be to focus on your own business. So a lot of stuff that I notice, and I'm not an expert by any means, but a lot of the stuff I see will be um, people kind of building these relationships with vendors, which that sounds bad at first and it, I don't mean it in a negative way at all, but they'll be so focused on doing um, like styled shoots consistently all the time, not just a few to get their feet wet, but they focus so much on what other people are doing or doing um, building these relationships with people that they forget to build their relationship with their clients. So the super important thing to me is to focus on your own business and try to just really focus on what your clients are asking from you or looking for from you. And not everybody wants like, oh, I want to go to um, the mountains and be in this fancy dress. Like some people just want to wear their matching white t-shirts and be somewhere that's comfortable for them. So that's a huge thing I've noticed for being successful, not just on Facebook, but in general is to just really focus on who is your market and like who is coming to you and how you can be bettering that and just spending a little more time on that as opposed to focusing on your competition or going everywhere else other than that specific client. That, this is interesting. And, and, and of course, there's there's no minimizing the significance of relationships that we have with other vendors. They're definitely exactly. an opportunity for business, new business. Yeah. But you make an interesting point because there is a lot of focus from the photographer standpoint on, and I alluded to this earlier, an effort to create imagery that's that's beautiful to them as the photographer or to the photographer yeah. friends. They know they're going to get a lot of response from photographer friends who think it's a man. This this shoot's beautiful. It's incredible. This incredible location, the background, the details, etc. And the reality is, our clients or potential clients may not care as much, if at all, about that particular thing that's important to us. So exactly. there's there's always this, uh, balance is not the greatest word because it's all subjective in the end, but there is a, a, a fine line, maybe even a, a big line between creating imagery for ourselves and creating imagery for our clients that may not always equate to the exact same thing. You do have to find what works there, what the balance is, but understanding what your target client wants or target market wants and, and 
showing that consistently is so, so important. Yeah. And, and there's not, there is again, value in even having a styled shoot, especially if you are wanting to create certain images that reflect a look or a feel or a photograph to an environment that is a reflection of the, the target market that you're going after. But at the end of the day, be aware of what your client wants not only photograph that, but also consistently show that it's so important. I'm glad that you make that point. Yeah. And, and let's jump to the next point. Do you, do you have something else for us? Yes, I have um, a couple more. So the next one going off of the last one, which we talked about is the target audience. So that is so incredibly important for Facebook marketing. And that could be diving in and playing with like, the age group that you want to attract, or that could be, um, like I mentioned earlier with the interests, um, you could be wanting to attract more couples. So you do love romance stuff. That's going to attract those clients to you. And that is so incredibly important to dial in because once you get that target audience dialed in, your life will be so much easier on Facebook advertising. Well, and and we kind of covered this earlier when you were talking about how you run your your boosted posts and and the target audience. I think it, it's so important. The specificity is important. We talked about how that makes marketing easier as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you bring this up again. Be very clear about your brand position, which as we've talked about in the podcast before, ideally is developed as a result of the business model, which is a reflection of your, your life goals, your personal goals. Where do you want to go? Why do you even, why did you even start a photography business in the first place? That should then drive the business model that you create, which should drive the target client that you go after, and then be highly aware of what your, the language that your target client is speaking, and then utilize that in the marketing efforts there on Facebook. That's really great. Take us to the last one. So the last one, this is, I saved the best for last. So reviews, reviews, reviews. So my Facebook, the second I created my page, I started asking every single client like, hey, no matter what your experience was, can you review me on Facebook? And I think you will bring in so much business by this specific thing alone. Like, reviews have the power to kind of put you put you on someone's newsfeed. If say if Sally gives you a review and her friend Joe is looking at stuff that she's liked before, he will see that and be like, oh, well, they look awesome if she likes them. So it really does drive traffic to not only your Facebook, but I feel like it can drive traffic to your site. And I've had some clients that have come from out of town. I did a maternity session with a couple from Florida. They ended up Googling like um, photographer Portland reviews because I guess they wanted to find someone who was obviously reputable since they were traveling through. And apparently I popped up in their thing because I want to say there, I have a good good amount of reviews. So that definitely helps. So even if you're just saying, hey, I know we just shot, but I would super appreciate if you would take the time to write a review for me because it really helps my business. And that to me is the most important thing. Like I feel like my business is created around reviews from these incredible people that I've worked with. And there again is the focus on the client, as you said. I mean, at the end of the yeah. day, the client is the one that you're serving. And, and in many cases, they're the ones that are going to drive new business. So it's important to make sure you're creating that experience that then translates to the positive review. Also interesting, too, to me that you're proactively asking for that review. I, I know that oh, yeah. even my personality, having been in business now for close to, I don't know, about 20 years or so, um, I, I just, I'm, I guess I'm hesitant when it comes to asking somebody for something, um, <laughs> yeah, but, <it's> hard. <laughs> but just being okay with, with saying, Hey, do you, do you mind leaving a review that that's, that's a great reminder and an encouragement for our listeners. And, and I appreciate you sharing that. So the, the five ideas, consistency, certainly in posting, staying active, especially in engagement, um, focusing on your, your business and more specifically your clients, your target market and speaking their language, understanding mm -hmm that target market in great details, number four, and then the significance of reviews. I really appreciate you sharing uh, a bit of your experience, and I'm sure you could probably cover another hour or two easily. This is such <laughs> a loaded topic, Sarah. But um, first of all, again, kudos to you for 
creating such a successful business in such a short amount of time. Uh, you're very humble about it, but the, the thing that, that really sticks out to me is your proactivity and continuing to try to improve, to see what works, what doesn't, make adjustments, and drive your business forward. This is really, really awesome. Uh, for those of you listening, and you're going to want to go check out Sarah's uh, work, particularly on Instagram. I just Your feed is beautiful. Will you share with our Thank listeners you. again where they can find you online? Yeah, so my Instagram, um, all my stuff's pretty consistent, but my Instagram is Sarah Lynn, S-A-R-A-H-L-Y-N-N, photography, and then PDX. That's my Instagram name. That's also my website. So Sarah Lynn Photography, PDX.com. And then Facebook is just Facebook.com slash photos by Sarah Lynn. So they're pretty pretty easy to find. Perfect. Yeah, and we'll make sure to link to this, uh, to these in the show notes as well. So for those of you listening in, just go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H podcast.com. You'll be able to see the show notes from this particular episode. Thank you again, Sarah, for making time for the Boca podcast. Thank you. I had a great time talking to you. Like I said, I'm a huge fan. So this was awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. But then thank you also for contributing. And, and by the way, for those of you listening in, don't hesitate to reach out. If you've got feedback about the episodes, content that you want us to cover, or you're even interested in coming on the podcast as a guest, don't hesitate to reach out. If you'll just go to bocapodcast.com and you can contact us or comment there through the podcast. Uh, you can leave a review, of course, through iTunes. Uh, you can also just email me directly. It's probably the easiest way to go about it. Nathan at photographersedit.com. Be glad to have a conversation with you. Maybe we can get you on the podcast as well. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Come.